Hey guys, welcome back to Biscuit Zone. My name is completely irrelevant to the topic, which is alternate trig function algorithms or approximations, uh, particularly for sine and cosine, besides the Taylor series expansion that we implemented back in the beginning of this series. Um, I want to talk about the performance, the memory footprint, as well as the accuracy of each algorithm and some comparisons between them. I have a bunch of algorithms here today, so you'll be kind of <laughs> interested in them, um, both on the low end and the high end as far as accuracy and runtime and everything. The whole gambit is here, so it's pretty cool stuff. Um, I have a lot of high-level takeaways, um, even beyond just the actual algorithms themselves. So I think you'll enjoy this as much as I did over the past two weeks going through this. I really love this kind of stuff personally. Uh, okay, first, some misconceptions. One is that there's an idea that hardware is always faster than software. I would say, yeah, in general, that's the case, but not always. There's some overhead related to, I'm speaking here about the floating point unit. There is a hardware instruction, F sine and F cosine, as well as other instructions as well for the x87 math coprocessor. Um, that's for boomers, really old stuff. But um, there's some overhead regarding how you get floating point values on the FPU and then back off. And if you're gonna constantly be switching back and forth between the FPU and like SSE2 instructions like we have in this series, there's gonna be some overhead there that you wouldn't already have if you were to stay on the FPU entirely. Either way, what I'm saying is that there is sometimes a case where software is just better than hardware as far as performance is concerned. And also the hardware instructions are extremely accurate. They have to provide enough accuracy for all the bits that you put in. And so the question is, do you always need that much accuracy? Mm, not so much. So number two, integer arithmetic is always faster than floating point. I would say in general, yes. And if you can come up with an algorithm, the same algorithm in you know, integer and floating point, probably the integer algorithm is gonna be faster, but you know, there are sometimes shortcuts you can take with floating point. And um, also there's an expense related to converting ins to floats with the convert instructions and stuff like that. So it's not always the case. I'll leave it at that. Number three, the idea that you always need high accuracy functions. In reality, you really don't. Unless you're designing like, you know, or planning caliber missile trajectories to hit Ukrainian power stations or something, you don't really need 16 digits of accuracy on your sine and cosine, I don't think. Um, all the time, you know, three, four, five is more than enough. And uh, even for our applications, we don't go more than like six or seven digits of accuracy for all our 3D rendering. So you don't need as much as you think you need most of the time. Uh, number four, a specific approach will be best for all applications. Obviously that's, you know, obviously false. You know, you have to tailor your approach for the application. As I said before, if you don't need the accuracy, maybe pick a worse algorithm. If you don't have the memory space to, to spare, maybe pick a smaller algorithm. The choice is yours, right? Number five, slow algorithms will make your code do slow. I wanna show you that even the fastest of the fast algorithms are not that much faster than the slow ones. Um, you'll see here in a few minutes that's the case. It's not gonna be a huge impact on your, on your performance know that there's always more important things than your math <laughs> implementations. You know, uh, writing to the screen, writing to the, a file is always very slow. And most of the time, in my experience, that's what limits your speed, not so much um, your sign approximation. Of course, obviously, if you can avoid slow functions, avoid them, but it's not gonna make or break your runtime. In fact, most of the time your CPU is sitting idle you know, you really, you can spare a couple nanoseconds here and there for a slower algorithm if it's easier to implement. Um, second to last, simple algorithms are always easiest to implement. You'll see that's not the case. Sometimes the more complex algorithms are easier <laughs> to implement, and I'll show you perhaps why that is. And lastly, um, there's nothing to be gained by comparing apples to oranges. In this video, we're gonna be comparing apples to oranges, to plums, to pears. And I wanna show you that even though we're doing that, you can still garner some high level understanding and the takeaways from this. Okay, so right into it now. Here are the two easiest sine and cosine approximations. Um, the first is, 
the small angle approximation. You may have heard that before. A lot of engineers use this to simplify their equations. So sine of x is basically x, same with tangent of x, and cosine of x is basically 1 for small values of x. Or you can take a look at 1 minus x squared over 2. That's also a perhaps a better way to approximate cosine. Either way, this is very fast, as you would expect. In fact, you don't even have to do anything. You can literally inline and play, replace sine of x for x in your other algorithm. So if you have some other algorithm that uses sine and cosine, we'll just replace that with these approximations here. So really, there's going to be no overhead as far as memory footprint. You're just replacing sine of x with x. And this is very, very fast, as you would expect. But it's only valid around x equals 0, or perhaps higher um, values as well. Like, for example, uh, you know, you can, you know, sine and cosine, they're periodic. So you, maybe you can remap higher values back towards zero as well. But either way, it's only valid over a very small, small range. Also, what about return zero? This is perhaps a, a dumb approximation of sine and cosine, but uh, it is right infrequently and periodically. This is more of a control than anything else to compare our other algorithms against. But even this is valid every two pi, right? So you can perhaps use this if you know that you're going to pass in a, an n pi into your sine of x, cosine of x uh, functions. OK, how about some a little bit more challenging approximations here? Well, one might be a lookup table. This is one that's very simple. And the idea is basically you pre-generate and store however many sine of x values in order. And maybe the first one is for sine of 0. The next one is for sine of some small x. So let's call it like, you know, delta t. Then you have sine of 2 delta t, and so on. 3, 4, 5 delta t, etc. And uh, basically, by passing in an input number, you can say, hey, I passed in 7 delta t. Well, you check the table. What is the 7th or 8th element down that table? and then pull it out and return. So it can be very, very fast. And also, it can be tailored to your application. Um, so if you need a big table, you can have a big table. If you can get away with a small table, you can use a small table. But obviously, the bigger the table, the higher your accuracy. And honestly, the, um, the scaling is pretty good. I'm not sure what caching even means, but as far as I could tell, when you scale up this table, it doesn't really cost you anything as far as runtime. It just makes your program more accurate. Obviously, if you have an immense table, it's going to have some expense as far as that entire table cannot be lo located entirely in your cache. And so there's going to be a, a problem with that. But either way, uh, it's going to be pretty close as far as performance. Um, then you have these two hardware instructions I mentioned before, f sine and f cosine. They're on the math coprocessor that you have on your computer right now, if you're watching this series, probably. Um, it's decently fast. They are extremely accurate. I think they have like the maximum accuracy that you can get. However, there is a significant overhead when you have to load in the contents of an XMM register onto the FPU because you have to actually go through a memory address to do that. And so you basically have to go from a register into memory onto the FPU, do the instruction, and then undo the last three instructions. So it is a little bit of an expensive operation to get this set up, especially if you're not using the FPU for all your math. But it has a very small footprint and it just works. And you can just call this whenever you want. And it's honestly a great bang for your buck. Then you have this Bascara, whatever his name is, uh, approximation from like a thousand years ago. He basically has these two um, estimates here for sine and cosine. You can see them here. They're very fast. They're good enough like almost all the time. And they're valid over only a very small range. So you have to remap into that range. But uh, either way, these polynomials or whatever you call these types of things are uh, extremely good as far as accuracy for how much space they take up in memory. So very efficient approximations. This guy is an ultimate boomer. He's from like, you know, prehistoric times, but he's a really smart guy. So great approximations there. Now, 
we have some approximations for math enjoyers. So Taylor series, we already covered that in the beginning of this project. However, it is just the sum of these terms and the terms scale and they keep shrinking by the factorial here on the bottom. And so you get more and more accuracy, the more terms that you have that you're adding up. Um, and so you have a configurable accuracy. You can change how many ends you wanna add up, five, 10, 20, and you can relate very easily the number of terms to the accuracy because the 10th term is going to be you know, this. And if that number is less than your tolerance, you can stop. So it's very easy to decide when to stop your approximation. And then for the uh, idea of how efficient it is, you have a pretty good bang for your buck as far as memory footprint and performance. I'll show you the results in a minute. Um, so wait for that, but it has a very good speed for decent accuracy. And uh, the problem though is that it's only valid over a small range as many of these algorithms are. And so you have to constantly think about remapping. So if you pass in sine of 0.3, this might handle your problem directly, but then what about sine of 10 trillion and three? Well, you have to constantly subtract off some number of two pies to get back into the range where this is actually valid. So it's easy to implement, documentation is everywhere, and we've used this for everything so far in the series, and we'll probably continue to do so in the future. Chebyshev series is one that is better. However, there's almost no good documentation on this out there, unless you're really good at math and can figure it out yourself. I do have this one paper, I'll pull it up here. Um, this paper is by this uh, Schoenfelder fella. Um, basically, he's tabulated these approximations, this table basically of uh, coefficients A. And uh, what you do is you basically compute this T term, multiply it by A and add them up. And for a different amount of terms, you have more and more accuracy. And he computes it all the way down for 10 to the negative 40th in accuracy. However, I he has it both for cosine and for sine and for other ones as well. Um, I'll link this in the description. Um, however, I do think there's a typo somewhere in these tables because I'm not getting the perfect accuracy that he's at, he's bragging about. But either way, um, we can evaluate this ourselves and compute our own coefficients. But from what I can see here, the accuracy is is lacking. But that's just a problem of a, I think a typo in this table. So with that out of the way. Um, back to Chebyshev as far as pros and cons. Again, it has configurable accuracy, so the more terms you have, the more accurate you're going to be. And this, you'll see, is probably the best bang for your buck. This is like the, the optimal selection of your coefficients for a given accuracy. It's kind of the whole idea behind Chebyshev as far as I'm aware. And so it's very fast with very good accuracy, and you'll see that result in a second. Um, but again, it's only valid over a very small range. And so you have to remap back into that range. And uh, as I said before, there's not much papers or you know pseudocode out there to look at. You have to do this by yourself. You're kind of on your own for this. Okay. And lastly, the one that gets chilled all the time, I'm not sure why, is this boomer cordic approximation thing. Um, and we have two ways to do this, one with floats and one with integers. And the idea is simple. You can look up videos and stuff on this or look up the Wikipedia. I do have it open actually. Um, the Wikipedia algorithm here actually implements, I think it's in Python, the floating point method. Um, so not exactly the intended use case, but I do have a pretty good integer paper. I'll put that in the description as well. This guy, Michael Bertrand has a pretty awesome 16 bit implementation, but we'll do, we'll do much more than that in this video. But uh, the idea is basically, either with ints or floats, you basically start with the right half of this circle and then you constantly, it's not really bisecting, but you keep breaking apart this sector of the circle into smaller and smaller pieces, correcting with an arc tangent until you converge on your given angle. And uh, by adding different, well, subsequently smaller and smaller and smaller arc tangent values, you can converge on both your sine and cosine actually at the same time. So there's like a double uh, throughput there as well. But the idea behind this is it's a, it's a boomer algorithm because it has, for integers, 
there's no hardware multiplies. There's only add, subtract, and shift. I can show you this guy's paper if you're curious. The algorithm, a lot of boilerplate stuff, but um, where is the algorithm? Basically right here. Here's the iteration of the Cortic algorithm. So you access the table, you add to your running angle sum essentially, and then you just add and bit shifts by different amounts. So there's no multiplies. It's a very efficient integer approach for this problem. Um, but there is a, so I should say, you can get extremely high accuracy, like, like insanely high accuracy with this, even though it's integer only. You may think the integers are, you know, for rounding and stuff, you must lose precision on that. You actually have a, probably the highest accuracy of any of these methods, with the exception potentially of the FPU, because you actually have 80 bits of accuracy on that, not 64. But either way, extreme accuracy, really decent speed, but a particularly large footprint, especially if you want to handle different amounts of tolerance at, at runtime. If you want to say, hey, I want 10 terms this time, but 30 terms this time, you'll have some overhead there to handle both those cases. And for floating point, it's much the same. You have inherently worse accuracy because you have this um, accumulated floating point error. Um, so it's worse than the integer version. It is seemingly faster though. So you may think, well, this bit shifts must be super fast. Yeah, they're fast, but when you have to constantly um, access memory to pull things out of these tables and remember you're passing in a floating point number in the first place. And so that has to be converted and there has to be adjustments for the, you know, your domain. Are we sine of 3 million pi again, or are we near zero? And so there is some overhead that you have to do either way for both. And um, a lot of the time, all those convert instructions and memory accesses may not be as fast as grabbing something from, from memory as a floating point or keeping it in a register as a floating point. So yeah, there's some pros and cons to each of these two. Now for the actual results, sorry to keep you waiting. Um, so what I have here is basically, and this is the example today, I have one for sine and cosine both. Here's the sine one. We've, we're averaging basically um, well, we're generating like half a million random numbers and evaluating the sine and or cosine of them. And in the first row, you can see the first five of these half a million signs and the exact answer for the sine of that number. So sine of 6.34 is zero. And these random numbers are always between, I think, negative 10 and 10. So they're beyond the range where any of these algorithms is going to be valid. but um, you know, like most of these algorithms are only valid between like zero and pi over two or negative pi to pi, et cetera. So this is outside that range, obviously. Um, and so you are looking at the time and the performance and the memory footprint and accuracy of, of this entire setup of taking the input X, mapping it back to the range that we can use our approximation over, and then the function itself executing. So. This is before the, these are the first five of the half a million signs. Here's the exact sign. I think we're using the FPU to evaluate this exact quantity here. And then I have each algorithm. And then for each algorithm I have just for these first five signs, or first five X's, one, two, three, four, five, the corresponding function evaluation for this approximation. In this case, return zero, always return zero, which is the whole point of it. But for other ones, you can see here, for Taylor series, for example, this is very close to the exact answer for sine of 6.34. So a little bit hard to read this table, but that's the idea. And then I have the error plotted here. So for a given approximation, what is the error from the exact answer? And then I have a, a time in fractions of a second for how long it took to execute half a million of these signs through each individual algorithm. And then I have uh, divided that out basically per each sign, how many CPU cycles that was more or less. And there's some variation in this, so don't take too much confidence in these numbers, but the overall trend is there. Okay, so the first thing, and then also I have on the right-hand side the byte counts of each algorithm rounded to a multiple of 64 because I've aligned these all to 64 byte boundary 
for again just an apples to apples comparison of the performance okay so returning zero as you would expect is extremely fast seven cycles per each sign so very very efficient um, just to basically replace the x value with zero of course not a very accurate algorithm you can see the error is quite large in this case it's error of one basically error of one so um, not too good that's actually really bad <laughs> um, but the memory footprint is zero so that's kind of the gold standard here as far as memory size now the small angle approximation now this is only valid around x equals zero and none of these particular x's that i'm showing is near zero and so all the errors are quite large you can see here this is a terrible error error of seven in this case very very bad but again cycles is six actually it's even faster than return zero because i can literally inline replace the x with the new, the new x right sine of x equals x i can just return from this function directly there's nothing to be loaded into the registers at all so even faster than return zero and again zero bytes now into the more you know accurate algorithms i would say or more useful i would say um first is the taylor series and so for this i've picked some tolerance it's probably around one E negative nine or something I would say just based off this error I'm seeing here and you can see now we are very close to the exact answer we're within E negative nine for all of these and it takes us 221 cycles for each sign and we're using this type of uh, algorithm for everything in the schizone series so far and so clearly it's not slow but you'll say hey it is way slower than small angle approximation sure it is but you're getting way more accuracy for the time and the memory footprint is 384 bytes so larger but nowhere near as large as you would expect a lot of these other libraries to implement this type of stuff um, very very small function even though it's much bigger than these two simpler functions okay so that's kind of our first real function not really sure how that compares here to look at some other functions so lookup table now this one i've only implemented i think it's 100 for this particular case um items in that lookup table so you're inherently going to be remember sign goes from negative one to one and so if you divide that two you know y value delta into 100 spaces that's what 0.02 and so you're looking like yeah we're probably going to be within uh like 0.02 for for most of these and you can see just by having that table in there even just having a hundred elements you're already up to 704 bytes so almost double the Taylor series implementation that we've used so far in this series and you have worse accuracy so all the haters out there that say hey Taylor series sucks it's this dumb cringe math thing it is that is true it is a cringe math thing but as far as accuracy as far as footprint and as far as speed well i guess speed is faster but is it worth it if you're going to be so far off now i will say if you're going if you can sacrifice the bytes if i can go from 100 to 10,000, then all of a sudden my accuracy reduces by a factor of what 100 right and so then we're in the realm of maybe not matching this other series but being closer and this cycle count is not going to increase by much if at all so you have to weigh that is it worth the extra bytes the extra bloat in my binary or not so yeah good question then we have Bascara. now here's an interesting one right so for Bascara, you'll see that the cycle count is actually less and remember this one was that that uh, a thousand year old approximation here and you'll see that it was faster than the lookup table and it had comparable if not better accuracy than the lookup table for that many elements in it and the byte count of the binary is smaller so almost the hands down well i would say definitely hands down better for this lookup table size now if you were to increase the lookup table you know tenfold hundredfold thousandfold maybe it would be better as far as uh, accuracy but honestly you don't need more than e negative three accuracy for most applications in sine and cosine you may think that you do 
but think about it some more because <laughs> you really don't most of the time. Uh, so yeah, that's Pascar, a very good algorithm. And next is the hardware instruction. So this is that FPU, F sine or F cosine instruction. And here you can see this accuracy is, um, is perfect because we're using this as the definition of exact. <laughs> so yeah, zero error. Um, but look at the time it takes to do this. So just looking at this from Taylor series, it is slower. So using the FPU is slower than the Taylor series expansion with this many terms in it. Of course, better accuracy, but do you need that extra accuracy is the question. Is E negative nine not good enough for you? I don't know, check, figure it out yourself. I don't know, maybe it is. But the size of this binary is very small. It fits in one 64 byte block as far as alignment is concerned. So yeah, pretty cool stuff there. I would say if you don't care about, again, in this series, we made the decision that we're gonna only stick with SSC2 instructions um, for everything. So we're not gonna use this, but if you don't have that requirement, that constraint, I should say, yeah, go ahead, use this, this is great. It just works, plug and play, and uh, it's not that slow and gives you, I would say, extremely accurate, uh, accurate results. Now, here is the, the best one, in my opinion is this Chebyshev expansion thing. And just look at this. In less, and this is a polynomial random thingy, it's just some, some you know math stuff again. But look, it's faster than the hardware instruction. It is <coughs> essentially as accurate, right, e negative 16 for this many terms that I'm putting in here. And the file size is large, but not that large. And a lot of the, the file size here has to do with, I wanna support multiple um, tolerances. And so if I go back to this table here, you know, I wanna support up to 40, you know, E negative 40 of accuracy. In reality, we're not going that deep, but I've still wasted some bytes on storing these values in the table. So yeah, there's that. Um, but I would say this one is the best one as far as bang for your buck regarding um, file size, performance, and accuracy. Now into the two quartic approximations, floating point and integers. You'll see here that they are, are they exactly the same? Look at, look at these, the errors are the same, the signs are the same of everything that is sine of x. So they match exactly for these amount of terms that I've picked in the approximation. So this is as close as you can get to an apples to apples comparison of these two algorithms. Now for the floating point one, you'll see that it's slightly slower than the integer one, which is to be expected because it, it is slower to use floats most of the time than ints. Um, there is an implied denominator for the integer evaluation that we convert back out of at the end. And that's why it's so much faster. We don't have to keep tracking this. And I will say the, um, I guess the accuracy is up to a limit. You can increase this accuracy for the integer version, like almost to the, I mean, to the same degree that you can get the hardware instruction. You can get this error to be zero if you up the number of terms. You can't do that for the float. You're always accumulating some amount of floating point error and you'll never quite get to zero error relative to this, but you'll be able to get that with integers alone. So for that reason alone, if you want a truly exact answer and you can't use for whatever reason the hardware instructions, then use this quartic integer approximation. And so here's that you know misconception that integers are gonna be less accurate, not the case. If you have a very large impi denominator, you can get like every single bit of accuracy. There's no waste of bits on exponents or anything like that, or signs. If you can use the bits efficiently, you can get way more accuracy out of a fixed point or integer approximation and you can for a float. Just my takeaway top level here. And then also look at the size. So we are bigger a bit than the other algorithms in the in here, perhaps with the exception of lookup table for more terms. But uh, again, a lot of these bytes come from the fact where I wanna support multiple tolerances. If I wanna have 10 terms, 20 terms, 40 terms, the tables in these files and I'll show you those in a minute, 
are large enough to support multiple tolerances, multiple you know accuracies in the function call at runtime. Do you need that? No. You could pull all that out and get these byte counts way, way down if you wanted to. But again, even still, these byte counts are not massive and um, there's no reason to do that in my opinion. Okay, so with that out of the way, that's the kind of top level comparison. And you can see, um, one takeaway here is that there's not a huge variation. You may think, oh yeah, that algorithm is so slow. Taylor series is so slow. Well, first off, it's not. It was actually one of the fastest ones. But even still, look at the variation here as far as, you know, I'll, I'll call the, them the reasonable algorithms. So let's take a look at the ones that are of decent accuracy. So I'm going to ignore small angle, ret ignore return zero. Taylor series is one. Lookup table is, eh, I'll say not so much here, but maybe we'll grab it. Vascara, Hardware Instruction, Chebyshev, and the Cortex. If you look at all these, the fastest one of all these was Vascara at 50 cycles. The slowest one was Cordic Float at 700 cycles. So you're looking at a little over a factor of 10 in variation. But what are you getting? You're, you're getting six more digits of accuracy in the result. If you ignore the ones like Lookup Table and Vascara and you stick with the ones that are like E negative nine or better, what's the fastest one? Chebyshev, 178. The worst one is Cordic Float. 700. So even still, you're looking at a, a factor of four variation between the very best and the very worst algorithms. So not a huge factor. Factor of four is not massive at all. Factor of 400 is massive. Factor of four, not massive. So yeah, that's the takeaway I wanted to show with this, that even the slowest algorithm on this list is not going to really slow down your program unless that's the entirety of your program. Okay, so what are some caveats for this? Well, first, the footprint for some algorithms, as I mentioned, is inflated by having large tables of this pre-computed data, both lookup tables as well as just data for the algorithms themselves. And um, that gets even worse when you want to support multiple tolerances. Like, hey, I want to support 10 terms, 20 terms, 30 terms. I have to have more and more data in those tables to permit more and more uh, basically tolerances at runtime. So number two, the accuracy is all compared relative to the FPU instruction. So that could be wrong. The FPU could be wrong about all this and this entire table could be bogus. So I don't know, I guess I could check that, but I, I believe that it's correct personally. Uh, number three, implementations here are decent, but they could definitely be improved. I didn't spend much time know optimizing each algorithm all I did was implement them and then align them a little bit and debug them so I didn't spend time optimizing each one and so even that factor of four at the end of the day um, between Chebyshev and float that might not be a factor of four if I were to spend or you were to spend an hour or two optimizing these algorithms further okay and then I should say that there's a certain amount of variation in execution between each run, right? This takes maybe like five seconds to run half a million of each sign through each algorithm. And I've just screenshotted one result here. Of course, you can take the code, run it yourself and get similar numbers on your machine. Um, and there's gonna be some variation. So, hey, maybe it's a factor of four now, but it might be a factor of three on average. I don't know, could be. And then uh, lastly, the I should I can show you the code, but we're only timing as best as I can the algorithms themselves. So basically, we're calling a wrapper function for each algorithm, and that calls the function itself. So there's basically two calls and two returns, and then the function itself. So um, it's pretty, if I would say apples to apples in that regard, and we're using um, RDTSC, the instruction to basically read the number of cycles that have been, you know, elapsed on the on the hardware, as along with the syscall for the time that's elapsed, and so both of those are basically the same thing, but we're using that to evaluate the performance, and we've pulled all the random numbers and their generation out of the loop, just to make sure we have an apples to apples comparison, because the uh, random function, well, the the random instruction, well, 
the instruction that gives you a random number basically makes you wait until the number is ready and so uh, you, you can't keep calling that over and over and over again and time the result so that's pulled out of the loop and that's why if you look the um, memory footprint of the entire binary is large because I've allocated literally space for half a million random numbers in the binary directly so yeah there's that <laughs> not very good but whatever okay so all the code is available in this um, Oh, I spelled schizon wrong. Jeez, I can't even I'll fix that live, dude. That would have been bad. So yeah, it's all in this libmath expression trig directory. Chebyshev, the Cordex stuff, FPU, lookup table, all that's in here, sine and cosine. And I have two different benchmarking functions, programs that you can run um, to see on your machine the the stuff. So I'm gonna run this right now uh, here together. So I'll open up just the sign one so you can see how this is set up. Uh, and basically it's pretty straightforward. So we're including all the different sign approximations as well as functions to generate random numbers as well as time, the number of seconds and clock cycles that have elapsed and print the results out. And so Basically, uh, it prints out some formatting stuff. It loops through the different functions, loops through all of the random numbers, evaluates the sign of those numbers, prints them out, prints the time out, and then formats the result. And I mentioned before, this is a cool way to do this. I have a function table that includes both the string of the function name. So return zero is a, I guess 17 or something, 15 bytes long with the zero at the end, followed by a pointer to the function itself. And so I can kind of store an arbitrary number of functions in this table and then automatically loop through these. So if you wanted to add an approximation for sine, go ahead, add a sine function 10, add its name above that, and then change this number here to a nine and the whole thing would, uh, would keep running. That's great. And then uh, at the bottom here, I have basically each sine function implemented this is like the wrapper function. So here is return zero, you can see. It just XORs out X of M zero and returns. Here is the small angle approximation for sine. It just returns, right? You pass in X, I pass back out X. So this is the fastest algorithm, obviously. Then for the code series, you can see here, we pass in the tolerance. In this case, it's E negative eight or nine, whatever this happens to be. Uh, then it calls the, ex the actual sine function directly and then returns. And so I have lookup table, Beskara, FPU, Chebyshev, Cordic Flow, and Cordic Int here as well. So if I run this, wait a few moments, and it will dump all the data to the screen. And here you can see the table that we saw before with some uh, variation obviously in the cycle count and obviously the numbers have changed. So yeah. Point out right here, look at this number for x, 0.02. Well, small angle approximation, look at that, 0.02. So that came out pretty close to the exact answer, right? E negative six, even though it's an absolutely asinine, you know, zero instruction approximation, hey, it was pretty accurate for this particular input. So there's that. I also wanna show you, um, the algorithms themselves, just to give you an idea of how they're implemented, because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, lib math expression trig. Screw that, I hate that. We have arctangent, another arctangent. Cosine is Taylor series. We invented that one way back in the beginning of the series. Here's the Beskar approximation. Here you can see it literally just. Uh, remaps our input. So if you pass in, you know, x is 500, it remaps that back between zero and pi over two. That's the first thing it does. Gets an idea for the, the sign of this. So it has to negate the answer if it's the wrong sign, but that's fine. It tracks that in a flag. And then it just basically implements the Beskar approximation. You can see here, very simple floating point uh, registers here being used and then returns the answer. So 
very straightforward. Some hard-coded values in memory here for the comparison of the, the range, or I guess the, the input x needs to be remapped between 0 and pi over 2. And then also we have like pi squared, half pi, 4. Those things are required for the actual algorithm itself. You can see here, here's the algorithm cosine is pi squared minus four. So we have to have those stored as floating point numbers. Of course, you could convert four as an int into a float, but that is very slow. So we don't do that. That's Baskara. Here is the Chebyshev for floating point numbers. Um, and it does the same thing. It remaps our input to a certain range. In this case, zero to pi over two. Then it starts con you know, evaluating those t terms. If I open up the Boomer Schoenfelder paper, um, it basically implements this expansion, this, uh, this sum for a given number of inputs and that you pass in in RDI as number of inputs you want to evaluate. So if I want 10 terms, I could pass in RDI equals 10, etc. cetera. And uh, it goes how you think it would work. However, you can see here, here is the Chebyshev coefficients. And you'll note that I only have some number of these, but uh, either way, it's it's not up to 40, 40, 40 digits of accuracy. It, it stops way before that, because you can't have that much accuracy realistically and, um, and maintain the number of, of digits here. So you, you can't have the exponent and the accuracy both together, I think, in, in all this. But uh, either way, we have it all here just in case. And that's how that works. Now, here is the quartic approximation. This is the floating point quartic. And uh, this one basically implements the quartic algorithm, but doesn't use bit shifts. Instead, it uses hardware multiplies instead. And it's not all that much slower than the integer version. Um, so I would say it's pretty decent. But you see here that I have a lot of data here for what's called the K factor. I can show you that in a moment, as well as arc tangents, as well as, this is basically powers of two here as well. And so this is all trying to basically, do I have it open still? I do. This is basically, implement, oh, this is the wrong one. Um, you need an, an arc tangent table here to constantly, uh, correct your approximation for the the angle. And so you have a table for that. You have a table in this case for this, this divide equals two. This could be a bit shift, but I've stored that as a, uh, in this case, for floating point numbers, I've stored that as a bunch of powers of, of two, negative powers of two in a table. And then you have this Kn. This Kn is a function, well, a, a scalar that scales your output because without this, you kind of, you either gain or lose length of your approximation uh, ray or line segment, whatever that is. And so you have to have a, a correction factor and uh, that's computed basically as a function of number of terms. Because of that, you wanna be able to support multiple inputs, you know, tolerance of 10 terms, 20 terms, etc. And so this has to be implemented. In my case, I did a lookup table for that. That's uh, this table here. But uh, you could implement that logic that they have here in Python just the same, but it would be more expensive, I think, at, at runtime. Whatever you can pull out at compile time or even before compile time, I think is a good investment of your time and memory because uh, ultimately it's not a huge memory footprint for this and it's way faster than solving those K values at runtime. Uh, okay, there's that. Lookup table, here's the lookup table. So interesting stuff here. Basically, um, I decided to only use four way floats because as you saw before, the accuracy of this table is, well, of this algorithm is kind of limited and you don't get to the point where you actually need the full eight byte floats for this. Even four byte floats is enough to get your, you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.001 accuracy that we were seeing. And so I have these values here. This is basically a sign of every number between, I guess, zero and pi over two. Um, so for x is zero all the way to pi over two in increments of that range divided by 100, I'm guessing. And then we take the answer and we uh, map it to every other possible 
spot on the number line. So, you know, sine is very periodic. In fact, the very first pi over two of that plot can be flipped, negated, copied, translated around to make the entire plot over, you know, x negative infinity to infinity. So that's how that works. And then also you can see here this scalar, this is what computes the entire, uh, like which address in memory should we grab? And so basically whatever you pass in gets scaled by this and that determines how many bytes into the table we're looking. So that's how that works. Um, here is the integer quarter implementation. Um, this one is a little bit more sophisticated, took the longest to debug, but was also the most accurate and an extremely fast algorithm that we talked about today, um, only beaten out uh, by Chebyshev, in, but uh, potentially even more accurate than Chebyshev if you need it. And um, it enables you to pass in, obviously, both the x value as well as the number of iterations you want to execute. In this case, it supports from 1 to 60. Um, the example that I'm going to link in the description, this 16-bit implementation only handles up to 14, I believe, for number of iterations. Obviously, this is for older hardware. Uh, yeah, number of bits here is, is 14. But uh, I, either way, you pass that in, and there's a bunch of data down here to support that. And so here is the you can look it up how this works. A table of the initial x values, a table of the arc tangents, and you can see just how much accuracy you have. So this correlates the delta y to delta x essentially for each iteration of your quartic approximation. And you can see originally it's very, very large. And this is this is divided by two to the 60th or something as far as, so basically when you use this um, integer approximation, you're passing in basically a number integer that corresponds to your angle from zero all the way to two pi. And so I guess we're using 62 bits for that entire range. And so 60 bits for just the top quadrant, the first quadrant of that range. And so basically this, these numbers correlate to how many, so if we divided that entire circle into two to the 62 sectors, this is how many sectors in the first correction, second correction, third correction, etc., all the way down. And the very last correction you can see here is two. And so we're down into the, the weeds of the, the limit of our accuracy is basically down to one over two to the 60 second. So it's extremely accurate algorithm if you run it all the way to the end to this many terms, which we don't most of the time, you don't need to, but you potentially could. So that's how that works. Um, here is the FPU instruction. So here's kind of the overhead I was talking about before about, you know, why, uh, why is it so slow to use this hardware instruction? Shouldn't it be fast? Well, here's why. So we're using these X of M registers for everything in this project. That's how all our math is done. Normally you don't couple X of M registers with the FPU. FPU is something that you do separately. This coprocessor is separate entirely. You don't use them interchangeably, but you can. Here's how you would do that. Basically you would take your X value, dump it somewhere in memory, then load a quad word from memory, that memory address onto the you know stack of the coprocessor, call the instruction to evaluate the cosine that replaces on the stack x with cosine of x, and you pop it off back into memory, and then move it from memory back in the register, and then return. And so a lot of this is overhead that you wouldn't need to use. If your entire you know, code base was done on the FPU, or whatever you call this, the x87 coprocessor, you wouldn't need these two instructions, or these two instructions, or this instruction, or the call originally. This could literally just be done in line on the coprocessor and it would be way faster. However, to do apples apples comparison here, um, I, I wrap this, you can see here to make it work. It would be faster though, if you didn't have this overhead. And so that should be remembered because, hey, this instruction only works on the old boomer, you know, instruction. Maybe you should use the old boomer instructions for all your math. Hey, I don't know, maybe your algorithm can be converted over to the coprocessor instead up to you. Anyway, that's the gist. 
I just wanted to go through and take these like top level takeaways for you guys. Um, and you can see just the, the, the main takeaway I want to give you is it's not a huge difference. You can spend, you know, days and days debugging this, but is it really worth, you know, two days of your time to try and get Chebyshev to work when you could have just implemented, uh, you know, Taylor series and it would have been a little bit slower if, if that, or is it worth wasting time on Cordic to get that much accuracy and whatever else just to avoid hardware multiplies? Well, maybe not. Maybe Biscar is enough for you. Maybe you only need E negative three accuracy. Maybe you should try that. Hey, is do we have enough memory for a lookup table? Maybe we do. Do we not? Maybe we don't. Maybe we, ha we have to use the hardware instruction. Hey, how about this? What if our application only deals with very small angles? Maybe we can just use this one. That one's pretty good if you ask me for small angles. So yeah, think about your application. Not a huge difference as far as performance and uh, even file size is not a huge difference there either. These are all very small by today's standards as far as binaries go and um, ultimately performance accuracy, this is a, a trade-off you have to make on your own choice. And uh, I would say, my opinion, if I had to pick one of these, I'd probably pick Chebyshev, knowing what I know now. Um, but up to you, Chebyshev, Vascara, Taylor Series, all very good algorithms to do this. We're going to stick, I think, with Taylor Series as a matter of principle, but if you want to use these other ones, feel free. With that, I'll end the video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one.